Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I must at the outset apologise for our delayed start. Um, as I said to the Deputy Secretary General, I think she probably thinks we have a far greater population than four and a half million, given the difficulty of access to the building today. But I would like to uh, welcome uh, the Sec Deputy Secretary General. Um, we have waited quite a long time for this day. We've tried to uh, schedule and reschedule, but uh, we're delighted to welcome you here today. Uh, just a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, uh, if we could ask the phones uh, be turned off, but uh, feel, feel welcome to, to tweet at iiea.ie. Uh, the um, address and the question and answers at the uh, Deputy Secretary General's wish uh, uh, are on the record, and uh, there is no, no difficulty with that. Um, so the... Uh, Women, Peace and Security, uh, the Resilience of Resolution 1325. Uh, we are very happy to welcome Ambassador Gottemuller to speak about this uh, extremely interesting topic. Uh, I could go on at considerable length uh, um, if I'm giving you her curriculum vitae, but let me just give a few details. Uh, Ambassador Gottemuller took up her position in October 2016 after serving nearly five years as Under Secretary for Arms Control and International Security at the US Department of State, where she advised the Secretary of State on arms control, non-proliferation, and political military affairs. She was, at this time, Chief US Negotiator of the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, the New START, with the Russian Federation, which entered into force in February 2011. <clears throat> Prior to the Department of State, she was a senior associate with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, with joint appointments to the Non-Proliferation and Russian Program, and she served as director of the Carnegie Moscow Center between 2006 and 2008. And from 1998 to 2000, as Deputy Undersecretary of Energy for Defense, Nuclear Pro Non-Proliferation, and before that, Assistant Secretary and Director for Non-Proliferation and National Security uh, at the US Department of Energy. And prior to her work at the Department of Energy, Ambassador Guttemuller served for three years as Deputy Director of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. From 1993 to 1994, she served on the National Security Staff as Director for Russia. And she has taught on Soviet military policy and Russian security at Georgetown University. As I say, that is a summary. There is more, but uh, believe me. So, uh, as you can hear from uh, uh, the experience of Ambassador Guatemala, we're very, uh, we're very grateful that she's coming to speak to us today uh, to give us a keynote address, um, which will examine the role of women, peace, and security. She will discuss NATO's integrative approach to promoting gender equality with particular reference to its policy on women, peace, and security. And this policy provides the foundation for work on gender equality across the alliance and is framed around three guiding principles, inclusiveness, integration, and integrity. And this, uh, as I think anybody here will be aware, Resolution 1325 is used around the world as a policy tool to implement gender-sensitive conflict-related topics. It's also used as an organizing framework for actors outside the UN, such as NGOs and researchers, in a way that I think could be said that no other uh, Security Council resolution has been used. Um, it was the first, also the first formal and legal document that required parties to a conflict <coughs> to prevent violation of women's rights to support women's participation in peace negotiations and post-conflict reconstruction, and to promote women from gender-based, to protect women from gender-based violence. So it's been a seminal uh, um, moment in the UN and uh, across uh, wider institutions than the UN. <clears throat> um, Ambassador Gautamuller also comes to us uh, from uh, where NATO has also changed over the years from out of area to um, uh, working in conflict prevention. Uh, there's also been a significant change, as we were discussing, in uh, 
uh, cooperation with the EU, where we have uh, up to, as you said, 74 different areas of cooperation with the EU, which is a huge change from uh, uh, when there was a relative um, standoff uh, mm -hmm. a number of years ago between the two organisations. The cooperation is now outstanding and very profitable. <coughs> and uh, last but not least, just to mention, uh, the uh, Third Irish Action Plan on Women's Peace and Security was launched um, by the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, just last month. And uh, I think we, we feel proud of our record in this regard. Uh, this, uh, we're looking forward to working with the new action plan. Uh, there's a new dimension on uh, taking advantage of the experience of women in the conflict in Northern Ireland. And uh, we will move forward on that in cooperation, of course, with NATO. The floor is yours, Thank Ambassador. You. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. It's uh, wonderful to be here and to have this opportunity. We have indeed been planning this for a long time, and so I'm glad it came to fruition. And on such a beautiful day, to be honest, I've said to myself, uh, riding around town this morning, I want to move to Dublin. <laughs> so it's like this in the middle of January too, right? <laughs> Come back again. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all today. I'm really delighted to be in Ireland, uh, the island known for saints and scholars. Ireland is a very important partner of NATO. This year, we are celebrating 20 years of Ireland in the Partnership for Peace, the first of many NATO cooperation programs with partner countries. We cooperate in a variety of areas, including peacekeeping operations, where Ireland is an international leader. We also work together in countering improvised explosive devices where Ireland has valuable experience to share and sadly uh, among our partners around the world work on dealing with uh, imp improvised explosive devices and unexploded ordnance overall. This has become a global issue and so Ireland's experience is of great value not only to NATO but to other partners and colleagues around the world. We also share the same values, and we certainly share a strong commitment to the women, peace, and security agenda, an issue that is dear to my heart. Your country is a global champion on WPS. I'd like to congratulate you for launching your third national action plan on women, peace, and security in June of this year in Cork. To quote from the excellent review of your second national action plan, Ireland is interested in WPS because we know from lessons learned from the Northern Ireland peace process that in conflict resolution and building lasting peace, women's contribution is vital. Let me also mention the important role Ireland plays in support of the WPS agenda globally. You hosted two meetings of the Regional Acceleration for, uh, for Resolution 1325, known colloquially, colloquially as RAR. This platform, created in 2016, aims to facilitate the exchange of best practices and lessons learned in implementing the WPS agenda. It uh, does so by working among the participating organizations, the UN, the EU, the OSCE, the African Union, and last but not least, NATO. Ireland plays a key role in supporting NATO's WPS agenda not least by offering us Lieutenant Colonel Mary Carroll, who is with us today. And I'm delighted that you are with us today. I'm really glad you could join us. She is a serving officer in the Irish Defense Forces. She currently works as an advisor in the Office of the Secretary General, Special Representative for Women, Peace, and Security at NATO's headquarters in Brussels. Mary was the first Irish woman to command a UN peacekeeping mission on the Golan Heights in 2016. She brings remarkable experience and expertise to the team and to NATO more broadly. We also uh, were honored to have the Chief of Staff of your Defense Forces, Vice Admiral Mark Mellett, at the NATO headquarters recently, and he is with us again today. Thank you, sir, for being present. We really appreciate it. He explained at headquarters, this was back in June, that taking the WPS agenda seriously is crucial because greater gender balance and incorporating gender perspectives drive capability. We need this capability for peacemaking, peacekeeping, stabilization, and institutionalization of the norms and principles associated with civil society. This makes sense to me, believe me, and it is a view we share among the NATO community. 
Implementing the UN Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security has become a vital part of NATO's work. I am proud of the Alliance's record. We've had a policy on women, peace, and security in place since 2007. NATO leaders endorsed an updated version of the policy where they gathered, when they gathered just over a year ago at the NATO summit in Brussels. It's based around three I's, integration, inclusiveness, and integrity. I'm going to break from my prepared remarks here for a second to say 2007, yes, we put a WPS policy in place, but I have to say the refresher of that policy in 2017 is driving us harder and faster than ever before because we are focused now on implementation and on monitoring that implementation. And here, too, Ireland has a lot to offer because you have been focused on implementation and making sure that that implementation is monitoring, monitored. So we do look forward to learning from you in this process as well. But let me turn to the three eyes around which our policy is based. Mary already mentioned them, integration, inclusiveness, and integrity. First, integration. This is about integrating gender equality as a core part of all NATO policies, programs, and projects. Here, NATO is strengthening our cooperation with civil society on a range of issues to advance the WPS agenda most effect effectively. A panel of civil society advisors makes recommendations to NATO on how we can better integrate gender perspectives into everything we do, recognizing that what we do affects both men and women. And I'll break again from my prepared remarks to say this is the only civil society advisors organization we have at NATO. I'm very proud of it. We have people from uh, across, really, the Euro-Atlantic uh, area, and particularly those from the Western Balkans have been very helpful in, uh, in pushing uh, us ahead in our understanding of these issues. To those of you in the audience representing civil society, you can hear I'm enthusiastic about civil society, I want to say that your work makes an incredible difference in the lives of ordinary people around the world. It is not an easy job, but the results are worth the effort. In the words of Ireland's former president, Mary McAleese, it is absolutely no accident that the peace and reconciliation and indeed economic progress that eluded Ireland generation after generation for hundreds of years has at last come to pass in an Ireland where the talents of women are now flooding every aspect of life as never before. Long may this continue and very well said. Second I is inclusiveness. The representation of women across NATO and in national forces is vital to enhancing our effectiveness, our effectiveness in the field particularly. We want to increase the participation of women in all tasks and at all levels. We've made real progress in this area and uh, I will say in NATO it's been very important 85% of NATO countries have all position, positions in their armed forces open to women today. Seven allied nations currently have female defense ministers. Eight women currently serve as ambassadors to NATO's North Atlantic Council. Overall, we are seeing greater numbers of women in leadership positions, including in our military structures. We will soon, in November, have a woman commanding the NATO mission in Iraq, General Jenny Carrigan from Canada. And may I say, Canada's among the allies been a real leader on this issue. They will have three uh, general officers in command positions at NATO come this fall, including not only Jenny Kerrigan in Iraq, but also the commander of our standing naval group, SNMG2, will be a, 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 a naval uh, admiral, uh, and uh, the head of the NATO Defense College in Rome is also a Canadian general. So it's very, very notable that Canada is a real leader and a partner with us also on these important issues. This is all good progress, but is, it is only a beginning, and we must go further. More women on operational duty enhances our effectiveness. More diverse teams perform better. And if you want to build the effective forces to, uh, to face up to future challenges, ignoring 50% of your talent is a really bad idea, and I feel this very strongly. I think countries who do not uh, pull forth the talent from all of their all of their population is a country that is disadvantaged and I think uh, the development numbers we were uh, we were talking to uh, the chief this morning about this their development numbers and uh, numbers related to conflict uh, show that I know the Irish Defense Forces successfully embeds WPS within its training and international missions 
It is one of the very few militaries in the world to have its own exclusive action plan with many innovative ideas and actions for enhancing gender equality and diversity. I understand your military personnel significantly contributed to the development of your third national action plan. I think this is an excellent example for all of us. The third I is integrity. It is said that integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is looking. In 2019, the world continues to mistreat at least half of humanity. Women and girls are often horrendously treated, especially at times of conflict when rape and violence disproportionately affect women and girls. Treating everyone as equals with respect and basic human dignity should never be compromised, even in the midst of war. NATO has a special responsibility to make sure that its own troops always observe the very highest standards of behavior, whatever the circumstances. That is why we are in the process of developing the first ever NATO policy to pre prevent and respond to sexual exploitation and abuse. It is a big focus for us right now. We're working uh, hard to drive forward on the SCA policy so that this too can be endorsed at the level of our leaders when they come together in London. Uh, at the end of the year in December. So SEA is next on our agenda, always on our agenda, but in terms of getting the policy in place, we will work hard to get it endorsed at the leader's level by December this year. So integration, inclusiveness, and integrity. These are the watchwords as we move forward with our agenda to make gender equality an everyday reality for women and girls everywhere. For NATO, Realizing true gender equality at every level merits our constant attention and effort. We are heading in the right direction, I think. We will continue to work closely with other international organizations and with partner countries, importantly, Ireland, to further advance the women, peace, and security agenda. We benefit from your active engagement with the Alliance on this front, so from me, a big thank you once again. We thank you all for your leadership on WPS, and we look forward to working with you as we develop this agenda going forward. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to sit down now and uh, take your questions from the table, but I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Gottemuller. Uh, as, as the ambassador said, she is willing to take questions, and um, these can be on the record. Uh, perhaps uh, the questioners could identify themselves uh, and, uh, uh, as, they, as they put the questions. Ronan and then Valerie. Thank you. Uh, Ronan Tynan, a filmmaker and member of the Institute. Uh, first of all, I must uh, acknowledge that the chairperson said that I can understand why you would call uh, UN Resolution 1325A a seminal uh, moment in the history of the UN as I've studied 1325, but I would put it to you, and I really welcome the opportunity to put it to someone so senior in NATO as well, that Syria uniquely illustrates that 1325, while well, it certainly has generated a lot of fanfare in the breach, it might as well not exist. And I put it to you that really, if we are to see respect for women, and in Syria we see women raped, we see women, uh, slaughtered. In fact, when I was making the recent film, and I'm doing another one now, on Syria, I was quite shocked to discover that it's safer for women at home with children, or sorry, it's safer on the front line than in their own homes, the way in which, for example, barrel bombs were deployed in Syria. But that's just one example. It has done nothing to advance security, and that really we have to be looking at a much more fundamental new paradigm that places greater emphasis on human rights, because obviously, Women can only play their role in peacekeeping, can only play their role in a security situation where they are protected. And this is where the notion of human security comes in. And this, as you uniquely would be aware of what that means in practice, that I would put it to you that really until we prioritize that, we're wasting our time talking about w any impact 1325 can have in these terrible situations you also alluded to. Thank you, Ambassador. I think Valerie will probably talk about Syria as well. Yeah, it's just, it, it, it's just to add to, to that, um, it, thank you very much. Okay, okay, right. Sorry. Um, thank you, Ambassador. It was just to ask you as well, specifically, Ambassador, about um, the um, UN... Um, 
Board of Inquiry that NATO has asked Mr. Guterres, Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, to name the actual, to do an investigation into the bombing of hospitals specifically in Syria. And um, NATO has requested, this is one of the groups uh, who has requested Antonio Guterres, but it's, it's um, even though it has requested this, NATO doesn't seem to provide the tracking reports because as um, Mr. Bronk of the Russi Royal United Services Institute has indicated, um, NATO would be well aware of the Russian uh, planes taking off um, and where they are exactly. And they have asked the Syria group in the UK have provided a Syria briefing for the UK parliament. And they have asked specifically that NATO would um, not withhold the tracking information from the inquiry because the inquiry, it was withheld under Obama in uh, t three years ago today, September, uh, at this time in September, three years ago today, a UN assisted aid convoy was bombed for four hours. And at that time, uh, the information, tracking information was withheld, even though a US defense commander did speak out straight after the uh, killing to um, the Washington Post and said clearly Russia had been involved, but then he backtracked. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, let, let me take these on. First of all, I want to say straight out that NATO uh, per se is not involved uh, in Syria. Uh, and uh, of course, we uh, follow closely developments there because we are concerned that we have a NATO ally uh, adjacent, a neighbor of Syria, and that is Turkey. And there are uh, NATO allies who are involved in Turkey, I'm sorry, in Syria. Turkey is among them, the United States is another. So uh, we pay attention to what is occurring there. I would say as a, as a general matter uh, that we are very concerned about the, uh, the overall uh, threats to human rights that occur in these terrible conflicts, in these conflict zones, because at the, at the heart of uh, what NATO is about, it is these international values embedded in the Washington Treaty, which every NATO ally uh, 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 signs up to when they become NATO members, are uh, the, the values that are incorporated into the UN Charter. So it is truly part of, uh, of our DNA to be concerned. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think it's nearly 20 years since 1325 was negotiated. Progress has been very slow, you could say. And it's nice to hear you saying good things about Ireland, but would you say that that was equally true of the majority of UN member states? Is it time to move beyond 1325? The title is The Resilience of 1325. Has it been re resilient? Or is it a case of the, those who, who were most active in its negotiation having a strong commitment, but the rest just floating away? experience where we have a broad variety of NATO members. We have NATO members who have been there since NATO was created um, after World War II to begin to take on the threats uh, that emerged after the Iron Curtain came down. And so NATO began with its uh, original members in 1949. And then we have member states who were members of the Warsaw Pact uh, and came into NATO after the wall came down. Uh, in uh, 1989. So we have a broad spectrum of NATO members. What I can tell you is that 1325 has uh, enabled us to get everybody on the same page, at least in acknowledging the issues and understanding the issues and being willing to sign up to uh, an action plan, being willing to sign up to uh, certain uh, norms and uh, certain values. And that, I think, in itself is important. Because the next step then has, and I tried to indicate in my remarks, the next step has to be to put in place not only the policy, that's very pretty, thank you very much, but if the policy is not being implemented, what good is it? So the next phase, which we are embarked on now, is with an implementation plan in place to uh, really work hard on implementation and monitor that implementation to ensure, again, across the broad <coughs> spectrum of allies, we are getting results. That's going to be difficult because, again, broad range of allies, different points of view, different cultures, different histories. It's going to be difficult, but I think it's a, I think it's a long slog, frankly. And again, I would not criticize 1325 because it has not uh, produced, at this point in its uh, history, 
uh, perfect exalt results, but I do think it's been a very valuable tool because I can see that in NATO. Thank you. Next is Com. And uh, <clears throat> yes, I know <clears throat> we have three or four more questions, so we'll get we'll get around. Com. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Secretary General, for a very insightful talk. Um, you said something earlier, and it struck a chord to me, just in terms of NATO and UN approaches to the whole area of women, peace, and security. Um, in my experience, I've been involved in training and instructing personnel, both NATO personnel and UN personnel, where this area has, has encroached, has, has, has uh, become part of, of, we'll say, tactics, techniques, and procedures at, the, at that level. One of the things I found was within NATO, A, nearly all NATO troop contributing nations have some sort of training that percolates down to the platoon commander and, and below. That's not the case with the UN. Sometimes it gets stuck at brigade level and doesn't go any further and certainly doesn't become an apparent thing to the troops at the operational level. And secondly, even when it does, the di big difference I found between NATO and UN policy on this, NATO tended to um, instruct troops about looking at women who were caught up in conflict, not just as victims, but as potential key interlocutors, operational aids to getting into a community, to be guides into a community. That certainly wasn't the case within the UN. Uh, I think that's a big loss, and I just wonder what your thoughts are on that and how that could be dealt with uh, appropriately. <clears throat> yes, I actually have been very pleased that several of our interlocutors here in Dublin have made that point, and I've been pleased to hear it, frankly. My colleague James Mackey uh, has reminded me, frankly, that uh, back when we did have a combat mission in, uh, in Afghanistan that ended in 2014, ISAF, we did have uh, women working, um, uh, women, you know, uh, military working in the various units who were going out to the field, and they became very uh, important as trusted interlocutors with the local Afghan population, particularly the women, and therefore were helping to have a better understanding of what was going on on the ground. So they became very valuable in an operational sense. Uh, so I do think that it's important uh, to bear in mind that experience, I think, has informed NATO's, reflecting on it just in the last 24 hours, that experience has informed NATO's attitudes. And frankly, I have also uh, just become aware, I think, of the degree to which there is a differential there with other organizations such as the UN. I will say um, that in the last couple of years, we've developed very good working relationships, not only with the European Union, which has blossomed, uh, but also with uh, the United Nations, with uh, much more interaction, specifically on 1325. These are flagship areas of cooperation, not only with the EU, but also with the UN, so that I hope we can translate some of the experience we have had in the last decade uh, in a way that will be meaningful to uh, the peacekeeping organizations in, in those two uh, institutions, and that we perhaps can help to inform them in a way that will we'll get it down below that level <laughs> to be more effective on the ground. And certainly, once again, we will be very much valuing the experience of, of Ireland in, in helping to do that in other settings. I know you obviously work with the UN as well as with the EU also, so perhaps we can make some common cause in that regard. I hope we can as the country with the longest uh, experience of peacekeeping Indeed. in the whole of the UN uh, unbroken. We have another question here and then one at the back and then host. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, Katrina Dowd from Dublin City University. I wanted to perhaps take a, a slightly more positive view on 1325 because uh, you mentioned that it's one of many instruments, but as the chair mentioned, it's perhaps unique among UN resolutions and having generated so much momentum and those of us who might look at other resolutions around IHL or human rights and humanitarian crises might despair at how they have been left on the shelf in a way that for its faults or its shortcomings, 1325 has not. And I wondered if from an, uh, an organizational perspective, if you could speak to what you see as the key features or the key aspects of 1325 or mobilization around 1325 that have contributed to that momentum? That is an excellent question, and I think it's just uh, uh, stubborn energy from some key actors uh, in NATO. I will uh, name for one. Uh, your ambassador to the EU and representative uh, to NATO, Ambassador Helena Nolan, who's here with us today, uh, partners, 
push NATO on this matter. We also have a number, I mentioned the, the fact that a third of our ambassadors at NATO now uh, are women, but it's not only the women around the North Atlantic Council table who push <coughs> this, but also uh, a, number of, uh, a number of our ambassadors, uh, the ambassador of Norway, for example. Norway been a, has been a very staunch supporter of advancing 1325. So it's a matter of national commitment I think uh, sometimes it's a matter of personal commitment among, among our uh, allied ambassadors, but mostly that personal commitment is linked back to a strong national commitment. And uh, I could name also the Netherlands, the UK, for example, very strong pushes from several directions uh, in, in NATO. So it's a kind of uh, cussed, a cussedness, a kind of stubbornness to push the issue forward that uh, I think has been uh, very, very good uh, for NATO, per se. I can only speak for, for the experience of my institution. Frankly, when I arrived in 2016, three years ago, uh, the issue was still a bit adrift. We had our nice action plan from 2007, but it wasn't being implemented. And uh, we've been joking the last two days as I've been here that it was always at the bottom of the list. You'd go through your talking points for the ministerial and oh, support for WPS 1325 was always at the bottom of the list. I've been gratified to see as these three years have gone on that it's becoming more you know, up the list of priorities to be pursued and associated with operational effectiveness. And that's the key. It has to have, uh, for NATO as a defensive alliance, it has to have some sense of a utility to our missions and operations. And so I think that recognition, it's been slow in coming, but, but is starting to develop more. And, and that's an important factor as well. Thank you, yes. And you have a question? Yeah. The microphone's coming here, yes. <coughs> My name is Anastasia Crickley. I'm an activist, uh, one-time academic, but I was also a member of the steering group for the last Women, Peace, and Security uh, action plan, Irish action plan. And thank you for your address. I think it's been very useful. I particularly like your integration, inclusiveness, and integrity framework. And uh, building a little bit on the question with regard to 1325 and where it's gone, and also building on Ronan Tynan's earlier um, enunciation of the human rights frame, I wonder would you agree that perhaps an intersectional approach, rather than trying to change 1325, that by now globally we have the instruments that we need to create the conditions for full integration of women in peace and security mechanisms. And two things I, I would just like to suggest to you. One is an intersectional approach with the human rights treaty body framework of the UN in particular, but other agency, other regional institutions as well to begin with. For example, I'm conscious, Liberia is a country I'm quite familiar with, and I'm conscious of the extent to which perhaps a discrimination against minority women there can play a particular mm -hmm. role in how they were able to engage in peace and security mechanisms there, and how perhaps other forms of discrimination against women, which are addressed in that framework and in regional frameworks, both of the African Union, perhaps, and of the, <coughs> of the Council of Europe can help. And then on the other side as well, I really liked your thought about monitoring, uh, implementation with monitoring. It seems to me, though, that perhaps another term there needs to be about not just output, but also monitoring for impact and doing it in a yes, way that's gender sensitive and focuses on the impact for women at all stages in the process. Thank you. Yes, Thank that's, you. that's yeah. a very good point. Um, you know, I'm very much a pragmatist in my approach to things, and how I think about this is that we are. Um, we are building also on accumulated experience. The Northern Ireland peace process is one area of accumulated experience where the role of women was uh, <coughs> extraordinarily important. I had the good fortune to sit down with uh, and have dinner with a number of women last evening who had been involved in different aspects of the peace process. And it came home to me uh, how much work has been done here. I, I knew that for a fact, but just understanding the, the depth and breadth of the work uh, that had uh, and the experience accumulated here in the process of coming coming to uh, to peace that's and and then the continuing issues that uh, that must be tackled so it's not like it's a a quiescent issue it's an active issue that that has to uh, have constant attention so that's a good example and then you know the different peace processes that have been more or less successful. I had the good fortune this week to meet with the woman who was the chief negotiator in the Philippines peace process with the Islamic uh, group there. 
and her very strong commitment uh, to the notion that uh, women negotiators play a special role because they uh, can uh, they can diffuse a situation at a negotiating table where a man might decide he has to get up and walk out. They'll perhaps be a bit more patient or figure out a way to to talk to the next stage, you know. And to me, all of that accumulated experience, I could mention Colombia again. Uh, I could mention what went on uh, in Sri Lanka uh, years ago. Uh, these more or less successful peace processes going forward have presented us with enough practical examples that that's where I see we, we need to examine them. And I know many people uh, in the academic community here in Ireland uh, are doing so. We have to examine them and think about what the lessons learned are and try to build, build out from there. So uh, I think perhaps your, uh, your thought about approaches which would be in the realm of high policy, perhaps in the UN setting, could be very valuable as well. I, I can't comment on that, but I, I do see the value of, of building out from the pragmatic progress that has been made uh, in the last two decades. Thank you, Horst, and then we take Horst. Former NATO officer. My name is Horst Sietschlag. I'm a German citizen. And I spent 12 years in the Royal NATO headquarters in military and civilian diplomatic positions. Very good to meet I you. Have one observation and two questions. Okay. Observation <coughs> women in NATO not only started. already 20 years ago when I was applying after military retirement to got a civilian post in the NATO international staff. Mm -hmm. At that time already recruitment boards were encouraged to <coughs> get suitable women in these positions mm -hmm. and they had to compete with young female academics and diplomats and I think I only uh, managed to get away from the stereotype at that time, gray, retired, male, uh, because I didn't have too much gray hairs at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but my questions are more related to your own professional background beyond of your achievements in promoting the case of women. The first question is INF, Intermediate mm -hmm. Nuclear Forces. Treaty which has been cancelled now from both partners, US and USSR and Russia. What is NATO going to do to challenge the Russian position mm -hmm. without <coughs> embarking in another arms race which would have a lot of problems <coughs> for European allies? Yes. The second question looking to the future. What, what, what country might be the next? Georgia or Finland? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the well, that second one is easy to answer because um, we know uh, that Georgia is actually an aspirant country that was embraced at the Bucharest summit meeting uh, now over a decade ago, and it still remains on that list because the Georgians have clearly expressed a desire to join NATO. NATO has accepted that fact, embraced that fact. Georgia has a distance to go still. We are, con in fact, we're just about to take a trip uh, to Georgia in a, in a couple weeks. I'm leading the North Atlantic Council in the first few days of October to Georgia to, uh, to review with them their progress so far, but they've still got some work to do on reform. And frankly, we at NATO are a little bit concerned about some of the backsliding on reform, watching what's been happening with the judiciary there and so forth. So we'll be very keen to talk with the Georgian leadership about how they see the reform prognosis uh, at the moment. So uh, Georgia is already an aspirant. It's, it's expressed its desire to join NATO, and, and NATO allies are ready to work with it on that aspiration. Finland has not. Finland has long uh, embraced its neutrality. Uh, Finland, uh, the, and again, it's a matter also for each, each government to consider what public opinion is. Public opinion in Finland does not uh, stand up for NATO membership. So uh, we uh, feel quite comfortable with that. We have a number of partners, including Ireland, 
who are neutral. They don't ever want to join NATO, but we work very closely with them nevertheless. So that question is easy to answer. Actually, I think the INF Treaty question is rather easy to answer as well. If, if you're not familiar with this issue, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty has been in existence uh, since the late 1980s. It banned uh, all um, nuclear and conventional intermediate range ground launched uh, systems in Europe, uh, those, uh, or globally rather. Uh, uh, those are missiles in the range from 500 kilometers uh, to 5,500 kilometers. So it's quite a wide range of missiles. The Russians uh, developed a new missile uh, called in NATO parlance the SSC-8 and they began deploying it some years ago. I worked hard as a U.S. diplomat before I took the job at NATO to try to get them to back away from that program, to eliminate the missiles and remain compliant with the INF Treaty. The Trump administration did the same. They refused uh, to come back into compliance with the treaty. So a treaty that's been hollowed out because one side is not implementing it anymore does not serve anybody's security. So that is why uh, NATO supported the United States when in August it, uh, it decided to leave the INF Treaty. Now, what are we going to do next? As always, in the context of deterrence and defense, but also dialogue, NATO is working on a dual track. First of all, we do have a package of options that we are looking at that are uh, defensive in nature. They are uh, in line with international law, and they are certainly, I think, uh, very judicious in our approach. First of all, looking at better integrated air and missile defense, looking at uh, resilience, how we ensure, you know, despite facing this, this new threat from Russia, that, uh, that our forces uh, will be resilient uh, in spite of it. Better uh, intelligence and warning more training and exercises so we understand to how to handle the threat as it is, uh, looking at uh, the resilience of also NATO's uh, dual capable aircraft mission, which is our nuclear uh, mission. But one thing I want to stress, and this is an important message for this audience as well, NATO uh, has no intention of deploying new ground launched intermediate range nuclear missiles in Europe. So this is not a replay of the dual track decision from, from 1987. It's, uh, or it was made earlier and then it was uh, brought to its close by uh, the 1987 entry into force of INF. That debate in the <coughs> late 70s into the 1980s about uh, you know, the deployment of, of uh, Soviet missiles at that time, the, the uh, SS-20 and then NATO deployed the so-called Pershing-2 and, and Glickums, the ground launch cruise missiles to respond to that, was a huge debate inside NATO. It proved to be effective in terms of leveraging the Soviets to the negotiating table, but we're not seeing a replay of that now. We have no intention of deploying new nuclear missiles in, in Europe, period. And so I think we have to be judicious about our response and we also have to work the other side of the ledger, the arms control side of the ledger. And so we are looking for ways to uh, also uh, bring uh, the Russians to the negotiating table, but possibly others as well. The administration in Washington has taken note that the Chinese are deploying a large number of such missiles out in Asia. Can we look at ways to bring them and other countries who deploy such missiles uh, in South Asia, the Indians and Pakistanis, DPRK, well, we're dealing with them in another setting. Iran uh, clearly has some very effective missiles now. So are there ways to work this issue more broadly as well? But, but NATO is contributing to that, uh, that strand of work as well and will continue to do so. We will always be committed to the dialogue track as well as to deterrence and defense. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I will leave the last question to the um, Chief of Defense staff. Uh, Admiral Mark Mallet. Yeah, Mark Mallet, I'm the Chief of Defence. Just to, to reinforce how important uh, 1325 is to us in terms of defence forces shaping in terms of how we develop as an organisation. You know, it's clear to us that um, improving gender balance, institutionalising a gender perspective um, and empowerment of women is critical to our capability and in fact right now it's a risk issue for us because we're, we're not making the progress we'd like. And we look in terms of where we deliver services internationally wherever the gender gap is greatest interstate and intrastate conflict is greatest and th that's why you know when we send our troops abroad we ensure that the training is right that the gender advisors are there and we go in with that perspective 
But I suppose one mission that we did spend um, quite a long time, 15 years ago, 15 years in, was in Afghanistan. And as I look now towards the peace and reconciliation that's there, I worry because when I look at the gender gap indices and I look where Afghanistan is, and, and, and I know there has been some progress, but still it is not reflecting very well. And I would be concerned that um, perhaps a change in regime and a change in institutions would perhaps cause a slippage in terms of, rather than progressing on that, a gender gap index, it actually would begin to widen again. And I wonder, would you have any comments on that? This is a question that has been uh, widely discussed around the North Atlantic Council table. All of the allies are concerned uh, that whatever peace and reconciliation process uh, emerges in Afghanistan, that the primary objective must be to uh, sustain the constitutional gains of the last uh, of the last two decades and that means ensuring also that women and girls uh, can be educated ensuring that women and girls their rights are respected ensuring that we don't fall into the morass that we experienced uh, again uh, when everything uh, fell apart two decades ago so I think for the NATO allies this issue will be front and center as we I hope, are able to move into a peace and reconciliation process in, in Afghanistan. So we will really want to look again at, at uh, not only uh, practical ways to preserve those gains, but also recognizing that it is against the backdrop of profound pressures uh, to perhaps move backwards. And, and uh, I think we're all going to have to bear that in mind. Thank you very much. Um, um, uh, to all the questioners and to the Chief of Defence Staff, and uh, particularly to you for um, your generosity, not only in your remarks, but in, in answering the many and varied questions we have. I think you've left us with the feeling that um, there is a strong commitment in NATO uh, to implementing uh, the uh, 1325, not just talking about it. It is moving up the agenda. I think probably what is important um, in terms of seeing practical uh, results on the ground is, is gender advisors in military mm -hmm. missions. Yeah. Uh, I think we have noted that where this has been the case uh, in missions we've been involved in, there is somebody who is at the front line keeping an eye on it, and it's not just a, a commitment that isn't, isn't backed up. Um, I think in answer to your second last question to Horst, you really opened a huge other debate uh, in terms of um, uh, the challenges that are uh, in the world and uh, that, that uh, could take us for many more hours, but it does leave us with the consciousness um, that they, of the, the insecurity that is involved, but also the challenge that, as you said, 50% of uh, um, the world, uh, world's population needs to be brought in uh, to defend the, the uh, values that uh, mm -hmm. NATO, the EU and the UN uh, hold very closely. So thank you so much thank for you. your participation. We wish you very well um, for the future and I really appreciate your coming. Thank uh, you for the invitation. It must be a very busy time for you. So thank you again. My pleasure.